Okay, cool. It looks like my audio is good. What is going on, y'all? I'm just posting my stream on Twitter here. And then we're gonna get started doing a little editing. Hello, hello. Apparently my Twitter passcode changed. Ah, we've texted you a login verification code. Anyways, what's going on everybody? Just posting this on Twitter here. Uh, today, today we're doing a little edit. Um, a little two birds with one stone. This is for a YouTube thing, so I'm gonna be putting together this image, which I just did a little pre-pro on. But we're gonna we're gonna have to do a little correction on this, as you can tell. So we're gonna be working on this photo today, and hopefully we'll be imaging in Hakos in a couple minutes. Uh, there is a small chance of rain, a couple clouds on the horizon. So we're just going to wait for these clouds to pass, and it should start to clear up. And then I'm going to be working on um, new discoveries in the Southern Hemisphere tonight, and then perhaps a, uh, a collab image with Andrew that I'm going to be working on soon. So a lot of things going on. All of which very exciting. Yeah, clouds. Clouds are no good, but you know. We still got this great M101 data to work with though, which is gonna be fun. So let's get started on this. The uh, You have to see this up close first off because this data is pretty bonkers it's pretty bananas it's a little bright so it's hard to really appreciate it but i mean that's pretty uh <laughs> it's pretty great if you ask me so we're just gonna have to uh edit this up there's a lot of cosmetic changes that have to happen and i'm gonna try and take it in a way that i don't normally do which I'm going to do my cosmetic corrections on a per layer basis and then we're going to re-merge the RGB result because obviously if I try to deal with this in a full color manner, um, I might run into some problems because the gradients in this image and the reflections are quite complex and it's going to need to be handled on like a per channel basis to make sense. So you can see here the different channels. There's different gradienting in each channel. If I'm looking at this right, <laughs> the full color image has a lot of blue. Okay, maybe I'm I'm straight up looking at this wrong. <laughs> There's the blue. There's the green. Okay, I was copy pasting the wrong stuff. So we want to get the red by itself. We want the green by itself. This should differ from the red. Okay, it's not. We're making new photos instead since this thing's not gonna let me live my life. We're just gonna split this up into grayscale photos. There, are you happy now Photoshop? So we'll have three 16-bit grayscale images, each one representing our color channels. 
And this should let us uh, deal with our gradient problem in a more cohesive manner. So that's red, that is the green, and this is the blue. Obviously the blue has got like the most stuff going on, so this is gonna take a gentle hand and a gentle touch to correct. And we wanna be careful about these stars here, obviously. Uh, this this isn't fog. It's a uh, reflection, internal reflection. The Arcos occasionally will struggle um, pretty bad with it, and um, especially around bright stars. But it just takes a little a little work to clean up usually. So oftentimes what I'll do here is I, I will come in with this soft light brush and just kind of darken things up. Obviously this reflection has like a pretty definite structure. So the soft light brush would need to be done very carefully in this region in particular, which is going to prove to be a challenge. Um, but you know I'm up for it. Uh, the focal length of this scope is a lot. It's three, six, five, four millimeters in focal length. So as you can see from the blue, um, there's not much to say. <laughs> the photo says it all. <laughs> It's, uh, to be certain, a special data set. Um, seeing was trending 0 0.8, 0 0.9 for most of the captures, so sub arc second, and we're sampling 0.2, so very oversampled, but that's what we're here for. I don't really play by normal people's sampling rules given that the scope is located at SRO and the saying is sub arc second like every night. It works out, let's just say. So I'm not looking for like a major correction in some of these things, a little bit will do. <sighs> this guy here has got a, this is more what I'm afraid of, this big broad effect. Looks like it paints out pretty easily though. You'll love to see it. Let's drop my opacity. I think I overcorrected one of these regions. Uh, hello, hello. What computer am I using? My computer is a custom built PC and you may find the complete part list, the specs, how I set it up, everything else in a YouTube video about my astrophotography editing PC, which is um, in my YouTube. So all the information for, for that stuff you can find. And this little this little lens flare here is a bright boy. Uh, but yeah, I paid maybe um, like all in with peripherals. It was like two k for this editing PC, but the actual parts um, are like only fifteen hundred. So if you've already got peripherals and everything else. then this PC is pretty cheap if you're looking to replicate it. And um, this PC has done me pretty solid for my big mosaics and all my other projects. Um, I'm definitely running into its limitations as far as like big mosaics go. So there might be an upgrade in my future, but probably not for a while, I would imagine. This is like, if you were to find the cheapest bang for your buck PC for Pix and Sight, this is pretty much it. I don't know if you could do any better. 
Uh, the telescope camera combo. So the particular telescope I use for this, this is a 16 inch Arcos, uh, Ritchie Creation Optical Systems. So it's like a big Ritchie Creation 16 inch F9, 3700 millimeters focal length whereabouts with a 6200 mm on the back, which puts me sampling at 0.2 and it's on a Paramount ME and it's sighted at SRO. And if you uh, if you're wondering more of the like specific gear details of that, it's all listed on my website. All the gear I use, every telescope, every camera, where they're located and what they're for. Um, I'm actually going to show that because I feel like not a lot of people know. If you go to my website astrofalls.com and you my gear, everything you may find here, um, including my wide field Takahashi rig, all of the links to the products the Namibia system, its location, all the filters, everything, the Arcos, my solar setup, my planetary setup, my Milky Way setup, it's all here. Question, you're currently imaging with 533 MC Pro on a 254 1200. I've thought about upgrading to a 10 inch Quattro on 183. Would it be a good decision if seeing isn't a problem? Um, yeah, that, that's a pretty high resolution system. I would, in particular, caution you away from the 183 mm. Actually, I've got one right here. This is my 183 mm. And while it is a, um, it's a good camera, calibrating the sensor is incredibly difficult and not perfect most of the times when I use it. Um, it has a really bad amp glow that mostly calibrates out, but um, can be quite difficult, even in the best of circumstances. So I might recommend you wait and save, either um, go with a 2600 mm or a 533 mm instead of the 183. With this sensor, you kind of really have to dump a lot of light on it to uh, be able to use it at a lower gain and then deal with the less amp glow. Of course, the 254-1200 scope would dump a lot of light on it, but it's a very it's a very niche camera. Not the best for DSO, but it also does like lunar, you can do planetary. So, I mean, if it, it depends on what your goals are. If you're looking to also do, you know, a little bit of lunar at the same time, then there really isn't a better camera or if you're looking to do a little planetary at the same time, because, you know, it's like a dual purpose system, then I'd get it. Otherwise, I would get one that's better for DSO, like the 533, if I was you. All right, this is what I'm most worried about right here. This little guy I'm gonna have to paint away like three different times. A uh, low-priced telescope for beginners, I would, uh, it depends on what you want to do. There's, I can't answer, like, specific gear questions without context, you know what I mean? Depending on the goal, uh, then I can answer, like, more accurately something that would make sense. But broadly speaking, if you're looking to do low budget and telescope, those words don't, uh, those things don't mix. <laughs> and uh, basically, if you're thinking of low budget astrophotography, what you really want is a camera lens, like a 135 camera lens, a Rockinon will do you solid, and then you'll use that as your quote unquote telescope. If you're wanting to do visual astronomy on the cheap, then a eight or six inch daub will do you well. Um, photos of the moon. Um, for photos of the moon, a Dobsonian will work. Um, if you're really hell-bent on the moon though, you might find uh, even better time using something like a, uh, a Celestron SCT, like a small one, like a 8SE. A little 8SC would be kind of a perfect little little moon rig.
right, I think I did pretty good on that. Good enough, at least. I think the whole region could actually become a bit darker. Hello, hello. A lot of you may be wondering why I don't just shoot new flats. Yeah, that was a dust moat. I do need to do new flats, but the problem is the camera power cable is kind of broken. And I'm waiting for it to get reconnected. And I just kind of feel like editing this now and not waiting for that to happen. Because I have to do sky flats and then I'm not going to be able to edit the photo until later tonight. So I'm just kind of... We're doing it now, you know what I mean? I am impatient. Um, no, that difference in resolution from 0.65 to 0.78 is uh, very negligible. Alright, let's catch a before and after. Pretty good cosmetic correction. All right, let's drop this back into the RGB. So here's our RGB, we just corrected the blue. Replace the blue and there we go. Blue problems are gone. Uh, yes, I did use the, the blur tool. I hit it with the blur X. Um, blur X is very good. <laughs> yes, breaking news, I photo I photoshopped my photos. Such is life. Alright, on to the green. I know this is riveting work. I guess, you know, flats wouldn't have solved most of these problems anyways, so it's not like I really messed up, you know what I mean? like this guy's got the very dynamic <laughs> swoosh lens flare as well. This is the worst one because it, it sits literally on top of the, the arm of the galaxy and not to mention that I can't clone stamp this stuff because it's like trichromatic and it sits inside the galaxy so I have to do this pain in the butt painting procedure. Oh yeah, god forbid I... Man, people on Twitter are so stupid. <laughs> I get into so many arguments because I offend other astrophotographers. Yeah, people, people just get offended. Basically, I, <laughs> yeah, I think people are salty and jealous. But for those unaware, I posted on Twitter like a small thread that no one saw about like the state of social media and my thoughts about it and how like you can, you know, alleviate some of the, the social media problem, which is getting reach, obviously, if you make creative and good works like, if you stand out and you take something that no one else has done, then obviously, um, you know, people are going to see that and you'll get attention because people, people just complain about their lack of social media reach, but, you know, 
there is a bit of that going on where like obviously reach for everyone is a bit smaller but you can choose to like let it make you upset and complain about it or you can you know try and take some new images try and do something unique and uh try and be better off for the challenge You'll get some better skies, key switches. Just time and patience. Yeah, a lot of a lot of salty people. I mean, it's like a hard fact that everyone who does astrophotography has to face. Um, oh. Is my screen cropped? I'm using the uh, I'm using the paint bucket tool. Let me adjust my OBS because I think my screen is stretched a bit. Okay, now you should be able to see. I'm using the paintbrush tool on soft light mode, and I'm just like painting in a synthetic flat. But uh, yeah, what was I saying? Yeah, this is a reality everyone has to contend with, which is the night sky is the same. We're all taking the same photo. We're doing it over and over and over again. And if you're a creative person and you have like an artistic bone in your body, then you're gonna like think about how that impacts your work and like the context around it. And a lot of people uh, don't wanna think about that idea because it makes them scared and uncomfortable that they must creatively challenge themselves. Cause I mean, this hobby is intermingled with a lot of uh, There's artsy people and there's sciencey people, and a lot of the sciencey people are very uncomfortable with that fact, I think, just on like a personality basis. Yeah, yeah, there's, and this is also what I was trying to say, like, even though we're all shooting the same thing, the, people can have their own creative takes on it. Um, you know, you can have a unique editing style, you can shoot in different filters, even though the things are the same, you can still be creative. And like, that's what I'm hoping to inspire people with that. Obviously, in spite of this, there are ways to still be creative, which is really great. Um, there is an end to it though like separate from concert photography obviously in like a concert or someone performing a moment's different from moment to moment but in astrophotography like you also can't be too unique with your editing style because you might stray too far from reality a reality that we all you know can see a photo of and see if something's real or not so there's this like line to tread with reality creativity art a whole bunch of things and it's it's a very complex problem you know some people are are big into the my photos are so realistic thing I'm not so much into that some people are more into a creative editing style that has more flair and that's very cool too you know we all get something different out of it and we all um, try and have our own takes to address the creativity problem. You can also address the creativity problem like shooting things differently. Um, someone like Rahelio, Deep Sky Colors, you know, doing big mosaics. You can show objects in a new light uh, and in a new context. Or you can look at things that people really don't look at and just kind of give people a new unique view. Look at old things and new filters, you know. There's a lot of options. Yeah, we all we all have our own uh, our own style. That's part of what makes it cool. Yes, yes. If you can't tell someone's image apart from someone else's, then 
there may be a lack in uniqueness and style. Um, the way you get there, though, can uh, can affect things. All right, looks like we just got red left. And then there's some minor things that need to be done. Yeah, and I mean, Rahelio even, uh... <laughs> my style is mosaics with mismatching backgrounds. <laughs> yeah, my style is uh, mosaics that aren't stitched well. <laughs> That's good. But Rahelio like says the same thing I say, and in some way I'm, you know, I'm equally as much inspired by uh, by his work. His his line about it though is that everyone is also shooting the same thing, but we're not taking into consideration composition. Most people just frame their thing in the middle of the frame and then they take a photo of it and there's no there's no context or composition involved like normal photography. So Rahelio's thing is all about composition and that was his um, like claim to uniqueness, which is definitely a good one. And did like a bunch of the very first pivotal uh, mosaics that people hadn't seen and that's why, of course, you all know his work to this day and you all know his legendary photos because he went and he did, you know, he incorporated that creativity to astrophotography that most people don't do. So in the face of that work, you know, the question you have to ask yourself is what are you going to do? <laughs> and that's a problem because obviously you could be another Rahelio clone and I have many photos that are like that which is just you know big mosaics I can reshoot all the photos he's already shot you know and while they would be technically challenging their creativity is questionable you know Yeah, there's uh there's a lot of new people, so I guess it uh it kind of frustrates a lot of people. I have a hard time sympathizing with beginners though. Um probably to my own downfall, but I'm like simply not interested a lot of the time in beginner stuff. It's just not compelling. I mean, even as a beginner, you can be creative. You know what I mean? Especially those people coming from a photography background. Like, it doesn't take a genius to, to see what's going on. But I guess for, um, oh, that's not the right band pass. For people who are more nerdy and they don't think about those things, that might be a tough ask, I guess. All right, I think that's a pretty good base point correction. There's still some rainbow going on, but I'm probably just gonna pull a fat clone stamp or something on that. Likewise up here. Um, no, this actually, this isn't the pinwheel from the other video. This is uh, from the Arcos. So this is a way better photo. <laughs> yeah, my, uh, this galaxy is big. I had to rotate it this way. Uh, 
Um, I do use a plugin for my diffraction spikes, actually, but I, I don't delete them. I'll uh, basically just add them on top. Um, I sometimes use noise X. However, in this image, there has not been any noise reduction applied. So this is just straight up deconvolved, no noise reduction. I prefer to not use noise reduction uh, if I can help it because it usually just cooks your photos. Uh, this is Photoshop. I just think it's crazy the number of background galaxies in between the spiral arms. Like there's galaxies in here. There's also <laughs> this big O3 emission nebula right here with all these other galaxies surrounding it. Just pretty nutty. My priority is making sure that these things don't end up overexposed, which I fear they already have been. So we're gonna go back to the this image before I stretched it, and I'm just gonna hit it with like a light arc sign, and we're gonna get back the cores of the bright background galaxies and the little emission boys that are all around. Wow, it looks so, <laughs> so cool with arc sign. You know, after all that talk about like astrophotography not being creative, it is a little hypocritical of me to be editing a photo like this because this isn't really uh, creative, you know what I mean? <laughs> the only thing good about this image is that it's going to be a very uh, technically good image. Like it's gonna be nice. It's gonna have a lot of detail, but that's all that can really be spoken about it. I guess I cropped it as well. No, I didn't crop it, okay. So I'm just doing a little faux HDR. Y'all know how it goes. Uh, I definitely want a soft round brush here. Let me undo that mess. Uh, no HA. Yeah, you have to, uh, you have to find the best of both worlds, I think. There's, a. Uh... Creativity and realism. And uniqueness. All that must be balanced. Uh, the telescope I use is a 16 inch Arcos and they are priceless because the company went bankrupt and you can't buy them anymore. So do with that information what you will. There is just a mind-boggling amount of stuff going on here. Uh, this little guy is very bright. I don't know what his name is, but he's gonna get the arc sign.
Thank you, Cosmic Facts. Uh, my favorite galaxy? That's a good question. I don't really like galaxies, if I'm being honest with you, but um, M33 is really cool. M101, this one's very cool. Um, I kind of fancy myself uh, an M33 man. Just because it has a lot of O3 emission nebulae in it, it's pretty cool. Thanks. Um, I like Sombrero a lot. Sombrero is cool. Very difficult to shoot, but very cool. <sighs> oh, I forgot. I need to see if it's clear in Namibia. There was like a 10% chance of rain and then the clouds are supposed to burn off. Beautiful. That's a pretty dreamy view right now. So the rain clouds are passing through, but you can see Orion in the moon setting. That's pretty nutty. I'm just waiting. For this to clear. Let me check the roof. My favorite nebula. <laughs> yeah, that one. Uh, I like Falls Object 1. That one's pretty cool. <laughs> I'm going to see if anyone else has their roof open right now. A couple people do. I'll pop mine open in a second. If these clouds go away. But this is... This is just kind of stupid. I think it would be wise of me to not do anything else to this photo. To just stop editing it now. Because anything I do at this point is probably just going to ruin it. It really just needs saturation. That's the only thing it needs. In which case, this will end up being a very short stream, but <laughs> if it means I don't ruin this data set, then I'm okay with that. Sometimes the, uh, the light from space doesn't need any touching up to be pretty. Maybe a little color noise reduction. How much do you invest to get an observatory off the ground? Um, the investment is quite a lot. Um, it's not my observatory, so to speak. It's a remote observatory in Africa. Um, but for a remote observatory system, you can expect to spend, you know, what you would on a typical deep sky rig, plus minus um, 500 to 1,000 for shipping alongside um, probably 2000 for a computer to run your system, 600 for a flat panel, and you know, you can remote any telescope you want, uh, but when it comes to like international stuff, you also have to consider the, the shipping, the insurance, the bat tax. There's, uh, there's a lot of stuff that no one's going to tell you about because no one really does it, and it's very, very, very expensive, so... It is a, uh, it's a lot. All right, finished photo. <laughs> I definitely uh, do need to fix up these colors though. We're gonna duplicate this layer and uh,
<laughs> yeah, it's uh, depending on how serious you are about this. I mean, it's for most people, it's a just for fun thing. You don't need to spend all that money. It's honestly just like professionals or super rich people that are at the remote observatories. So, you know, it's not cheap. It'd be cool if it was cheap. That's something I would like to maybe work on is uh, improving affordable access to uh, these kinds of conditions. Because it really is the most important thing. Like it, uh, astrophotography is a real estate game. It's just no one realizes it. Um, more people getting into this hobby will make it better or worse for the hobby. Uh, undoubtedly. The more people involved will make things better. The more people, the cheaper things can be. Um, the more people into the hobby, the more people there are to watch the videos and the better I will do. And the more people who uh, get into it, of course, you know, the more people appreciate the night sky, the more people care about light pollution, all these kinds of things. So astrophotography, I would say, definitely has a, a net positive impact on the world. And the more people who do it, the better, in my opinion. But mostly because it makes everything cheaper. I don't know about you, but I'm sick of spending <laughs> so much money <laughs> for everything. <laughs> so if these companies can manufacture things at greater scale, then it can be cheaper for everyone. Take a look at the cost for the same products in different countries. I'm assuming it's radically more expensive. Would I be right in that assumption? It's not dark enough in my room to see the rest of the chromatic issues. I think there's one in the bottom corner here. Get yoinked. It's kind of sad that it's more expensive outside the US. I wonder how many people, I mean, I'm sure there's a lot of European astrophotographers, um, especially in the UK. Feather touch. Oh, that's a lot for a focuser. Yeah, it's very interesting. Um, I've always found the European astrophotography thing a bit interesting, like given it's the worst skies on the planet almost, but yet in spite of this, so many people do it 
and are interested in it, which is, it's very cool. It's like a, it's like a lesson in dealing with hardship is like UK astrophotographers. It's pretty interesting. Yeah, anyone, anyone battling that out in the UK, a ton of respect because it's not as simple to deal with things there for sure. And um, there's so many like big astro YouTubers as well in the UK, which is, uh, it, it's just, I, I guess it's like culturally in the UK to be into astronomy given like the enlightenment and everything else. But man, what I wouldn't give to have a British accent. Yeah, Astro Biscuit. If I had a British accent, I'm just saying the YouTube game would be over. I would sound so much smarter. I'm probably just going to start talking in a British accent so I can get more views. Alright, someone stop me before I over HDR this. Yeah, a lot of people um, also got mad when I like made my top recommendations, like the only advice you need for Astro video, where I was like, if you have bad weather, you're not going to fix it by buying more expensive telescope, you know. You can buy the most expensive plane wave you want, but if you're in the UK, you're still in the UK. It's not going to change anything. A lot of people got mad at that advice. But if I was in the UK, I would uh, I would have a remote observatory in Spain. <laughs> Basically, that's uh, that would be what I would do. I would go remote, I would be in Spain or Namibia, and it's pretty cheap in Spain. The core was a bit much. Okay, we'll go, I think it needs to be darker, so we'll split the difference and go like 80%. Yeah, yeah, the European cost for everything. It's not a poor man's hobby. But such is life. I mean, do you pay a tariff to uh, import stuff to Spain? Because honestly, like even a cheap telescope in Spain, like not even an expensive one, you don't even need like premium gear would still do you better than being in the UK. I think that's like the general advice I'm trying to get across to most people is like, if you're living in the, these places, you don't need ultra expensive stuff. You just need to literally move where it is and you'll be better off. Yeah, the issue, like, the Scottish Highlands and stuff in the UK are quite dark, and that's great. It's just, you'll never get good opportunities to shoot there because it's just simply not clear and also very humid. It's not an astronomy-conducive environment. However, um... Some people, like uh, TW Astro, do really killer planetary from the UK. So, I mean, all's not lost for the UK because some people, well, maybe I guess you might not have great seeing, but on the Cornish coast, um, 
They seem to have quite good planetary seeing. So you kind of, um, part of the other points I try to make is that you can like play to your geographical strengths. Obviously not everyone is able to do great planetary. And some people in the UK have really great seeing for it. So it would make more sense to, uh, you know, specialize in that. I'm about to hit this with Star Spikes Pro. So you can see how I how I apply it. I don't do a lot, I just do a little, just a tiny bit. But yeah, I, I definitely acknowledge that I kind of got lucky. Uh, Mount Everest would be terrible for an observatory. Antarctica, there already is one. Uh, give me one sec, I'm thinking. Uh, yeah, where I was born, Phoenix, Arizona, obviously we have a ton of clear nights. So it was very great for, um... DSO work. Very hot there, though. So the convection heat and everything else, you know, conversely means it's not good for planetary. So that's why I am not a planetary imager. And on the flip side, Damien Peach, good thing, not a lot of clear nights. He's a planetary imager. So, you know, we play to our uh, geographic strengths to get the best results. Or, you know, if you can afford it, you just subvert the whole geography problem and go remote, which becomes like a literal necessity. Yeah, weather patterns have been a little um, inconsistent. <laughs> Those are some very good ge uh, geographic strengths. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna pull a Wolfgang Promper and I'm gonna downscale this photo into oblivion and then I'm gonna sharpen the living heck out of it. Oh, yeah. See, this is what Wolfgang does. Filter, sharpen, unsharp mask. You hit your image with the dirtiest downscale of all time. And then you sharpen it like a madman. I think I'm doing it wrong though. I think maybe I might need the starless copy if I'm gonna be like this. Does that benefit the image? Uh, yeah, it makes it look like when you post it to Astrobin that it's uh, a literal Hubble photo. Just people uh, won't be able to zoom in, but that's okay because it's gonna look like a Hubble photo, you know what I mean?
We're gonna wipe the stars out of this guy. If Star Exterminator is even gonna know what's going on. See, like when I downscaled it, um, all the stars like became properly sampled and also a bunch of noise went away. So now the image looks like, it literally just looks like a Hubble photo. Uh, no, this should not uh, affect our galaxies. It should just affect the stars. And even so, I'm not doing any star reduction to this image. I'm only gonna use the starless image as a method of high pass filtering. So it's gonna literally be there for sharpening only. And if there's no galaxies in the sharpened photo, then, or the sharpening layer, then the galaxies won't be sharpened, but they'll still be there. Yeah, when you when you post images to social media, don't be posting your full res. I mean, if you uh, if you're shooting with like a small res camera, then you know maybe you could post a full res. But there's literally no reason to be sharing like a 6200 mm photo in full res to Astrobin or anywhere else. You can just downscale it and. Uh, what did I save that as? Why did I save this as the file name tip? <laughs> That's dumb. Um, I just paste them back in if they get deleted. I don't really, uh, I mean, that's the only thing you can do with these if you get artifacts, that's, that's the only option. Oh, Lord, stop me from cooking this image. Yeah, um, that is the big brain move until you decide you want to print your image. This does kind of get a little wormy. I kind of just want this on the dust lanes. this then I can just get these the dust lines going and that right there makes it perfect for sharing on social media Yeah, sharpness 100, grain 100, saturation 100. For Astrobin, that's the edit, I think. Like, that's the one. But, um... Instagram demands more saturation. <laughs> like that.
you think it's possible to discover nebula with an OSD camera and no filters? Um, it's not out of the question, but I would say probably not. You would have to be um, a madman, a literal inhuman madman. I think I'm comfortable with that amount of saturation. However, we gotta mask that, mask that out right here. And on that, some of these things just ended up very yellow. Ooh. Hey Nico, what's going on? Uh, yeah, Reflection Nebula, Big Scope, Dark Skies. Technically you would be right that you could discover something like that, but it's very um, not likely. If you're gonna discover something, it's gonna be narrow band. I'm making these galaxies less yellow. there a lot. The only one I know about is um, Finn's Nebula, which Marcel found. That's the only one I know of off the top of my head. I think that's a finished photo. Let's say that as a JPEG. Are you uh, are you working on discovering some some reflection nebula, Nico? You got any? You got any finds? Oh, looks like a bunch of people got the roofs open. I think we might be ready to rock and roll here. Actually, no, definitely not ready to rock and roll. Still cloudy down there. You can't catalog them. That's really frustrating. At least you could, uh, I guess you could name them. You could give them a street name. That's how I always call it. The, uh, the colloquial name. Uh, downsizing for social media. The benefit is so you improve the signal and you make it appear visually sharper. 
uh, Instagram and the other social medias are going to downscale them for you. So you might as well do it yourself and uh, get some benefit out of it. There's a bunch of weird rules with like things that you discover as an amateur. I don't know anything about the reflections. I only know about the emissions and galaxies. Uh, Xavier told me that you can't, as an amateur, you're not allowed to discover galaxies. Like if you find a galaxy, then, you know, you don't really get your name after it. It's not, it doesn't count. But with planetary nebula and other things, it does count. I think I need to darken the blacks a little bit, but um, my monitor is like very whack with the shadows and I don't fully understand. I have a monitor calibrator, but it's not perfect all the time. Uh, yeah, I think. I would be pretty drastic with this photo. I would go to something like this, which on the histogram looks totally clipped, but on my monitor looks fine. Um, no, I don't think you, you technically don't really get credit and it's not like, you know, I don't think there are galaxies left to be discovered by amateurs. It's pretty much just a pro thing. Yeah, yeah, professionals aren't really, it's not a professional thing. You know, there's even a lot of supernova remnants that professionals don't seem to care about, which is quite strange. Like that one I found in Karina, they were just like, mm, we're not going to register it, good luck. And then I end up stumbling upon it and I get super excited because I think it's new, but it turns out psych. They just didn't bother to register it, so it, you know, it faked me out. I don't understand professional astronomy. I'm going to get the full res photo back. Um, and we're going to get it for a crop here. I believe the one I want is finished. Yeah, there we go. Um, will I ever do a shootout against Hubble? Um, as like a video, maybe. Um, I mean, I've, this target is one Hubble has done, but I mean, I haven't, you know, I haven't done a direct comparison in a while, like straight up, because those are usually kind of, I don't know. I'm not really interested in comparing myself to Hubble 24 seven. I might, it's interesting because sometimes it gets a lot of views, but um, sometimes you can just let the photo stand for itself. Um, I think for asteroids you do uh, get creds, which is pretty sweet. All right, we're gonna do a little swipey on Instagram and that's gonna be one of the swipes. There's a little, little tiny HA region right next to the core. That's pretty neat. 
It's kind of weird. It looks like the core has like a little triple structure because of the dust moat in front of it. Yeah, I've been uh, I've been kind of working with some pro people lately, and I think they kind of like that I will just point my telescope at anything they ask for as long as it's new. <laughs> like I'm uh, I'm like free telescope time for them for low surface brightness things. I'll show you. I'll give you guys a sneak peek of something. Um, this is not something anyone has seen visually, at least in radio, it exists, but, um, it, as you can see, not super visually interesting. I need to pull up the other continuum image. I think it lives in here. Yeah. So this, this is like a pretty recently discovered supernova remnant. It's called the Calvera supernova remnant that I, uh, I collected some O3 data on for fun. And you can see this is the continuum spectrum for the oxygen, the O3. And there's this big ring here. Um, it's not like totally superimposed on the Calvera remnant, but it's like it encompasses it in a way. So this is, uh, I think it's like 70 degrees. This is like a high latitude um, supernova remnant that no one's shot, only recently discovered. And this is something I did for uh, a professor just to try and, uh, you know, see if something was there. And potentially something's here given this ring, but they're trying to figure out if this ring is directly related to their supernova remnant because it's a big one. Uh, this is on my Takahashi. So pretty cool. Little faint ring. I think I can even, let me show you guys the, I have some annotated images of the SNR and the, the loop. So in the red is the loop that I found and this green is the Calvera remnant. So I'm not imaging it anymore because I was like 15 hours for almost literally nothing, but they're uh, going to see if there's any association. If there is, I might try and shoot more photos. If not, then, you know, this is all anyone will ever see of the supernova remnant for the foreseeable future. Just accidentally did a weird scroll thing. I thought I lost everything there. All right, image image size. The most I posted on Instagram is like 3,500. So it's gonna catch a small downscale. And eight bits. Name it Crappie, and I will send it to my Dropbox. And those are my finished photos. Of course, I'm going to need to adjust the shadows on that, but let's see. Can I start imaging in Namibia yet? Oh, we're good. We're good, baby. Just when I thought the stream would have to end, the stream is on. 
it's time to do some Astro. I'm popping my roof open. So tonight's going to be exciting. Uh, I'm kicking things off. First, I have some continuum data I need to grab. I have to check uh, this one thing you may do, Hickey, which shall remain unnamed and unlocated for now. But she needs a little, I need some continuum data from it. And I know the moon is out and I don't really care. It's not that deep. I'm in like Bortle negative 1 million. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna shoot blue anyways. And no one's gonna stop me. I'm gonna zero my mount really quick. And I'm gonna power on my gear. Roof still opening. <laughs> yeah, it's essentially Bortal negative a billion or something just ridiculous. It's literally the darkest observatory on the planet, so I'm, I'm gonna shoot my blue with the moon out. I need to do new darks, which is the, uh, <laughs> my struggle at the moment. It's kind of, uh, it's fall there right now, so it's still a little hot in the daytime, and I can't really, uh, it's even too hot at nighttime. All right. Kicking the night off. Uh, I've got a flat panel. That's how I do mine. That's a good question. I don't know. I've I've done some LRGB in the full moon and it honestly wasn't bad as long as it's from dark skies. I think it probably puts it at like Bortle 4. on those guy plate solve. And let's kick it off. Looks like I might have a little cloud right now in Pixis or Pupis, but how do you guys pronounce Puppis? Is it Puppis or Pupis? Because Pupis sounds really gross and Puppis sounds kind of dumb. I want to know who named that constellation. Poopus. <laughs> Poop. Poop is very funny. Pupus. So it is like a pupus. It sounds like a like an insect related term.
How did you find setting up the scope in Namibia? Wait, you can send a scope to La Palma? Yeah? I'm live streaming. Um, okay, so the Hakos people, Hakos, whatever, however you pronounce it, uh, they're cool. They're slow to reply to emails. They're slow to responding. Um, so if you get annoyed by people who aren't like 100% on top of replying to you, then it might not be for you. <laughs> but um, that's so far my experience. Uh, their Wi-Fi has gone out like twice. Uh, they did deal with the roofs when the Wi-Fi went out, though, so that's very cool. They care about equipment safety, which is nice, but um, it is remote, so the power and the Wi-Fi can go out, and they're pretty slow to reply. But, I mean, it's way cheaper, and now that I have stuff there, they're actually a bit faster, but, like, can getting everything ready and, like, ne negotiating to have the scopes and out there and all that stuff took a long time. Uh, it was quite difficult. I don't know if that's just because I'm American and, you know, it's mostly a European thing. But it definitely takes them a while. It's slow. Yeah, three weeks is a long time. And <laughs> that's a bit of a problem. That's pretty embarrassing. <laughs> but um, other than that, it's been nice. It's kind of cool to have my stuff there. I wouldn't recommend someone do it like me um, quite yet, though. It's, it's very weird and very niche. What I want to do, what my like potential time plan eventually is, is I want to have my own building built out there. Um, probably Tivoli, I might contract a building and then I'm going to start hosting myself and um, leasing out peers to other people, hopefully. I haven't had a conversation with Tivoli about that yet, but eventually that's what I want to do and then I can kind of solve the, uh, you know, slow to reply to email problem and hopefully have some kind of income from that, so... That's part of the plan is expanding. If I don't know if that's even possible yet, but it's something I'm I'm thinking about. Um, La Palma. I don't know anyone rented in La Palma, so that's pretty interesting. <laughs> no, you can get um. You can get a free telescope install, but you'll have to pay for my flight. <laughs> that's that's what I will offer. But I mean, chances are, if you send a telescope out there, you're gonna to wanna to go yourself. I plan, I mean, I would really hope that I can get out there this year. I don't know if it's gonna happen, but I would really love to go visit and say hi to the scope. Anyways, I can't really tell you much about what I'm shooting uh, other than that. It's uh, it's nothing that is well known about. Oh, it looks like I might have a passing cloud. Uh, definitely not M42. It's the, uh, it's the thing I noticed yesterday. Let me, let me show you guys a photo of it. It's this thing. That's what I'm looking at. 
So don't know anything about it. Could be just a random reflection nebula. They show up in 03 sometimes. No one knows, but we're, uh, we're taking a look at it. Just for fun. I need continuum data on it. I shot 03 last night. So. <laughs> Yes, such good data. But that's what we're looking at. Um, I do have some good news and some good developments on the... Uh, on this little man, this little guy. I found this one has a hot subdwarf in the middle. Well, actually, I didn't find it. Marcel helped because I suck at astrophysics and he searched the catalogs. So this has got a, uh, it's pretty much, this one's a slam dunk. So this one will probably be false object too, most likely, because this one is, I don't want to call it yet, but this one's pretty much a guarantee. So I'm not going to tell you where this one is. <laughs> Either way, it wouldn't matter because no one else would be able to shoot it before uh, it got checked. Um, La Palma, the more pro oriented. What's what is their name? Astro Farm? Astro Farm La Palma, a hosting site. Is it clear there right now? Huh. I guess it's not even dark there yet. That's weird. Let's see. I want to see their infrastructure. They don't even have any photos. It's, it's not daytime in La Palma, my guy. La Palma is like GMT minus one it should be it's dark there it's almost the same latitude as namibia so it should be dark there soon if not right now uh, i guess it's a bit more gmt yeah gmt plus one namibia is gmt minus two so it's fully dark there it should be dark here pretty soon Um, but why doesn't this place have any photos of their observatory? Well, it's interesting. I mean, it only makes sense that they have a place in La Palma, but they really need a... Oh, you do know. <laughs> yeah, okay, I guess, yeah, then they're all sky cameras, right? Um, that place needs better photos. And this also looks like good news because I don't see a reflection nebula here. So fingers crossed this one is good. I just gotta get my data. How much do they charge, Ronan? Oh, and while I'm at it, I need to start. I need to start the wide field rig.
All right, wide field going. That cloud is coming for me. Five hundred a month is still acceptable. I'd be curious about um, whether or not they're above the inversion layer at La Palma because uh, it looked like they weren't that close to the summit. If they're above the inversion, that's probably worth it. But if they're like too low elevation, then it's probably very wet there. So I guess that's the, the important thing to wonder about. Looks like Astro Farm La Palma. We'll be able to tell from how green it is. I mean, you don't you don't have to be at the top top of the mountain to be good. It can still be dry where they're at and still be good. Um, obviously would be more ideal to be higher up. Which island is this? Is this the same island with the observatories? Oh yeah, Roque de los Muchachos. Yeah, so the big ones are here, that's good. What the heck is that? Laguna. Hmm. Either way, interesting. Very interesting. But we got everything running, so that's good. I need to start moving over some of my files. These are my puppets, my puppets files. Oh, also their Wi-Fi is not like, it's not killer fast. And like I said, it does go out. I'm going to grab these. Dark Sky Hosting. Kind of a generic website name. It's all in Spanish too. <laughs> they have a poem. <laughs> they have a whole ass poem on their website. I actually kind of like it. It really speaks to me, but it's really funny that they just lead their website off with a poem. This probably sounds way better in Spanish. Tienes un telescopio increíble, la mejor cámara. Tienes los mejores filtros, los más estrechos, el mejor modelo. <laughs> That's hilarious. But there's literally nothing on their website. What is this? There's literally no information. Where even are they? On the island. They're, yeah, okay. 
I think they're lower down than the other places. The other place was like by Hoya Grande. But this is, uh, they, they got a lot of rivers here. I wonder what their uh, flood hazard is like. They're probably all dry though. That's funny. <sighs> yeah, they have no information on their website. It would be cool to see some photos, but it looks like a small mom and pop type deal. <sighs> Do they have an import tariff? In Spain, 21%. That's bad. Yeah, you gotta be, it takes a special kind of person to live in the middle of nowhere and a special kind of person to be into Astro. That's the hardest part is I would do it in a heartbeat, but it would require me living in the middle of nowhere or finding someone too. Yeah, EU's bad, but um, Namibia import VAT was like 15%, so 5% better. Should be able to check some of my initial subs now. Pupus bubble two. So you can see it here faintly. This, this is my guy right here. That smudge. Well, I hope maybe the UK is put into a great thousand year drought, in which case it's totally clear 24 seven and then the UK becomes a safe haven for astronomy. That would be pretty ironic. I don't think that's gonna happen anytime soon though. <laughs> All right, well, I do believe my work is done for the image editing. I gotta work on making some YouTube shorts, reels, etc. And um, probably at the end of today, I'm gonna be checking this spot, um, the continuum. But I won't be streaming that because that kind of has to stay secret. Um, but yeah, I hope you guys enjoyed watching the edit. And. Um, getting the Namibia telescope started is pretty, pretty fun. And I think we got a pretty good result. But yeah, I'll catch you guys uh, in the next one.